Hello and uh, welcome to our webinar on protecting children, creating citizens, participatory child protection practice, which we, the Centre for Research and Discretion and Paternalism, uh, together with the Centre on Law and Social Transformation, are presenting today. My name is Jenny Kruzina and I'm a researcher here at the Centre and I'm so happy to have you all here. This um, event is now a tradition that we organise um, every year with the Bergen Exchanges. Uh, for those of you that don't know it, it's an annual event that brings together scholars and practitioners from across the globe who seek to understand how law serves as an instrument of change and how it shapes and is shaped by power relations. As we all know, this year is a bit different, so we are especially happy to have so many of you here today and we hope that you find this an interesting event. Um, thank you for being here again. Um, to say a bit about what is happening today, um, we will first start with our keynote speech by uh, Katrin Krisch, who will talk about um, her new book. Katy is a professor of sociology at Emmanuel College in Boston, and she is an expert on child welfare systems in an international context. She's also a collaborator here at our center um, and a member of the Child Rights Unit at Law Transform. Her new book called Protecting Children, Creating Citizens, Participatory Child Protection Practice in Norway and the United States um, explores the ways in which children can be empowered to participate in child protection investigations and decisions. I won't say so much about this because Kati is going to present it all to us and uh, she's much better at explaining her research than I am. Following the keynote, we will have a, a panel discussion and some um, panel contributions from five panelists. Um, they will all give short presentations presenting different perspectives on, on the children's rights to participation. After that, we'll have approximately 30 minutes for questions and for discussions. Um, I will introduce our panelists for today after Kati's keynote. And um, just a few words of housekeeping before we start. Um, I would like to remind everyone that this webinar is being streamed. So uh, if you don't like that, then <laughs> now is the time to, to get out, but we hope we can stay. Um, for those of you, joining us via Zoom. We hope um, that you are interested in asking questions and to do so I'd like to ask you to send it to us via the chat function in Zoom. Um, okay, so um, without much further ado, I think uh, Kati, um, welcome and uh, looking forward to hearing your keynote. Hello everybody, it's uh, very nice to be with you. Jenny, thank you for the great introduction. Um, and putting a little bit of pressure, uh, saying that, uh, you know, I have a certain amount of time. <laughs> it's very useful. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all here, um, or to see some of you and to see the names of many of you who I know and uh, some of you who I don't, um, and hope to get to know at some point. So uh, what I'm uh, going to try to do is I'm going to try to share my screen now um, and I will give a PowerPoint presentation for about 20 to 25 minutes um, and uh, then we'll keep moving. Um, so I'm hoping that I'll be uh, a very good warm-up band for what's to come um, after me. <laughs> I'll give it a twirl. Okay, I'm going to uh, try and share my presentation now. Um, Yeni, what does this look like? Can you confirm with me that this is okay? It looks good. Looks good, looking good, okay. Uh, can you just confirm with me that you could see the outline as well? Yes, perfect. Yeah, okay, then we'll start, thank you. Then we'll start with that. Um, so um, I was thinking I'll tell you what I'm gonna talk about and then I'll, uh, I'll tell you. So um, uh, first I'd like to um, introduce the objectives of uh, my presentation today and what motivated it. Um, then what we usually do as you know, researchers, we provide some uh, um, definitions about the main terms that we are talking about. And uh, uh, the terms that I'd like to talk about mainly today is partic our participation and citizenship. Then very briefly, I'll talk about the methods and the data used uh, for the study that this forthcoming book is based on and then introduce the main idea, which is how uh, child protection caseworkers who uh, Marit and I interviewed, Marit Shivenes and I interviewed um, in uh, Norway and California, um, how they um, promoted children's participation in their practice. And um, I'd also like to give a little bit of a think um, on um, how we can move the needle forward in terms of uh, changing, in terms of improving um, children's participation in child protection. 
So um, my objectives, um, uh, the objectives of the book, uh, no, the objectives of today's talk, actually, um, what for you is for me to tell you about, for, for you to hear about the main idea of the book, which is doing participation. It's about how child protection caseworkers in Norway and California, how they encourage children's participation or how they say they, or they said they did when we interviewed them. Um, and um, as I said earlier, together reflect on how we can um, implement change that leads towards um, uh, children's uh, genuine partic participation and not only in child protection but also in other areas such as education, healthcare, juvenile justice, etc. Um, and um, I'm using this, um, so you can see the image here of an odometer and I use this image um, I've, I'm, I've really become sort of um, obsessed, is maybe not the right word, but really passionate about this topic and uh, thinking about it and how we can um, implement uh, change at um, the structural level and um, the organizational level um, towards participation. And I'm using this image of um, an odometer to talk about moving the needle forward because three of the child protection caseworkers interviewed for this book uh, talked about how they, they used a, a driving metaphor, how they drive a car together with children and how they do that. So um, they used the driving metaphor as a metaphor for children's participation. Um, now we know quite a bit, so my motivation was really um, prior research, my inspiration was really Marit's research, but my motivation was prior research that um, that is very strong in some areas and not as strong in others, so we know quite a bit, but perhaps not everything, about uh, participation barriers, um, so we know um, that children's young age um, and the perceptions that child protection caseworkers have of children can present a barrier to children's participation and we know about organizational barriers, the lack of meeting environments that are conducive to participation for instance. Um, but uh, what uh, we know less about is how what, what it is that um, street-level bureaucrats, so these are professionals who interact with um, service users or clients in face-to-face -face interactions. We, we know less about what they actually do to encourage participation. And the street-level bureaucrats can be um, teachers um, like, like I am, or they professors, they can be judges, they can be police officers, probation officers, etc. But they can also be child protection caseworkers. So my, um, so we can either and here you can see the image of, um, you can see actually two images. You can see a uh, positive space, what artists conceive of as po positive space and negative space. So you, you can look at participation as a wider um, topic in terms of non-participation and participation. Non-participation that literature has primarily focused on um, the barriers to participation. Um, it has not uh, been um, child, typically not child initiated or child led research. Um, it has typically not been comparative. Okay, so, um, but, um, and I've just told you what it does do uh, in the prior slide. Now, what I'd like to look at if you if you think of the two faces, I'd like to look at today at uh, uh, participation. What is it that child protection caseworkers in these two settings that we study do to promote partic children's participation? And um, I have sort of as the starting point for the book, I've used a definition of genuine participation that was proposed by David Archard and Marit um, in 2009, which contains two elements. One is the element of voice. The other is the element of consideration or weight. Voice means that um, children must have the opportunity to develop their own opinions, to reflect on them and to voice them. And consideration means that these voices actually receive consideration consideration that they um that the reflections and opinions carry some weight in decision making um and um so how do you measure uh part sorry i'm gonna jump ahead again how do you whoop, how do you measure participation so there are several approaches or models. Um, you can um, uh, look at the one that I'm going to use here is Roger Hart's 
um, ladder of children's participation, which discusses uh, children's participation in terms of a ladder and the rungs on a ladder. And I'm going to show you that in a moment. Harry Shear talks about the levels of participation. Um, Nigel Thomas uses the metaphor of a climbing wall. Um, uh, Jerison Lansdowne um, has a very interesting um, definition uh, or, or opera, uh, I'm not going to be able to say that word now, or measure, uh, which is uh, 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 includes consultative participation, collaborative participation, and child-led participation. I think this is pretty um, self-explanatory here. Um, and then this is um, Roger Hart's ladder um, of children's participation, it's called in the original version here. It's the image talks about the ladder of youth participation. And um, you can see if you look at the ladder, this is really, um, you have the, the three bottom rungs of the ladder are about non-participation and the top rungs are, are about participation or degrees of participation. And uh, the bottom rungs, um, depict participation that is that is actually that is non-participation, which is when adults manipulate children um, and uh, children are just uh, in the decision-making process. They are just there as tokens or as decoration, but they are not uh, really uh, full-blown participants um, in the terms in terms of the uh, the power they have to. Um, uh, shape decisions. And then um, the top rungs of the ladder, as you can see, uh, the, they are at the very top. You have uh, decisions that are shared between children and adults and that are initiated by children. Uh, then slightly below you have um, uh, decisions that are initiated by children but directed by and directed by adults. Um, and then the further it goes down, the less power children have uh, and the less they initiate. So, um, uh, you know, they, the, the decisions can be assigned or the children can be insulted about, uh, uh, consulted about decisions and informed, but they really not, they do not initiate them. Um, then I'm going to go, go and uh, move on to the next uh, major term um, that is related to the argument of this book, which is citizenship and the connection between participation and citizenship. And um, it took me a long time to figure this out, um, but I, I, um, um, I think what I'm trying to say is that a participation is a prerequisite for citizenship, uh, and this is why it's so important to um, to uh, study it. And citizenship um, is not um, so. I don't understand citizenship in the sense of um, you know having um, a, uh, like a document that, that that allows you to have to get a passport, um, be a citizen of a country, but uh, citizenship in the uh, the understanding of having the power to um, uh, make informed decision, having that social status, um, and that uh, social status you achieve through participation. And my thinking was based on work by sociologist Evelyn Nakano Glenn, um, who um, uh, infuses sort of uh, symbolic interactionism into the understanding of uh, citizenship, sort of the traditional one by T.H. Marshall, which is about rights, you know, social rights, political rights, etc. Um, and um, she uh, defines citizenship as a social status that is constructed on the one hand by formal rules through the law, but on the other hand also through interactions with with people, between people, between um, children and children, between adults and children. So um, this is, um, uh, it's, uh, if, you, if you will, this, it's, it's a constant, um, it's political socialization that, that leads to, um, to citizenship, to citizenship status. Political socialization through interactions with others. Um, Citizens are the individuals who have the opportunity to participate in decisions um, that affect their lives and the lives of their families and communities. And as you know, in child protection, um, uh, these are very important decisions. These are very, um, uh, these are salient interventions in um, children's and families' lives and child protection workers 
um, have authority to shape uh, these decisions and, and are responsible for doing so. Um, so uh, as street level bureaucrats, um, at the same time as they seek to protect children, they also um, they are also interacting with children. So how is it, my, you know, my question then became, how is it that they construct citizenship? Okay, that this is where the title creating citizen comes from. Um, and uh, this is the book, and as you can see, uh, so it comes out um, uh, at the end of um, uh, September. And um, as you can see, I used the, 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 actually the image of a ladder uh, on the cover because I wanted to show this, you know, like the, this ladder leading up, what is it that they actually do, these workers? Um, and, uh, but it's a safety ladder. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a ladder that um, people use who work on electricity lines, for instance. So it keeps you from falling. Um, it helps you. It's supposed to help you keep from falling off. So this it was supposed to show the tension in the child protection system between this um, the, the protective ethos of child protection versus the, the participation, which is the, the ladder climbing up. Um, so um, and what is it that, that workers do to deal with this tension? Um, so uh, the methods. This is um, a. Uh, this book is based on a study that uh, Marit um, was the PI on, um, and um, uh, it the interviews. So um, Marit uh, conducted interviews in Norway. Uh, Marit conducted most interviews with child protection case workers in California. These were very experienced workers who worked in public child protection agencies um, who we asked for instance and um, you know one of the interview questions that we asked uh, was when did a child's opinion matter a lot to your decision making um, uh, or um, we also asked um, at what stages in a case do you involve children and how do you involve children and this is what uh, um, the, my presentation today is mostly based on uh, the answers to these interview questions. Now um, what is the answer? How do they, how do these uh, case workers, these very experienced case workers, how do they do participation? How do they promote participation? Um, and uh, the data showed, my analysis of the data showed that 31 out of the 68 uh, workers engaged in participatory practices. Okay? So um, not all of them did or said that they did. No, we didn't observe people, we just um, spoke with them. So, um, and by this I mean genuine participation. Um, um, so they, what did they do? They actively, they, what, what did they say they do? They actively sought to engage children. Um, they, they actively sought to learn about children and they actively sought their trust. They also provided ample information to children um, that allowed them to understand what was going on with their case, what their responsibility was uh, in the child protection agency, meaning the responsibility of the worker, the role of the worker, the process um, that children were going to meet, were going to encounter. Um, they, um, uh, they told them about, um, you know, the, the availability of a spokesperson. Um, they made sure that children had the information that they needed to um, uh, develop informed, uh, an informed opinion and make decisions. Then they also gave children time and space to communicate. Um, so over and over again, they said that it takes time and um, it takes resources um, and it takes organizational resources. By space, I mean, you know, you have to uh, be in a space, in a meeting space, for instance, that is conducive to, to children's participation, that is non-threatening, that is supportive. Um, they also, what they also did was they divested what I've called that divested power through what I've called recognition work. So what that means is that workers, um, they either, um, and this is where sort of impression, this idea of impression management came in, comes in, through their facial displays, through their words, they conveyed to children that they wanted to share power with them, that they want to divest power away from themselves, that they wanted to give children choices, that they wanted to provide information. And they also, um, they also expressed empathy, um, they expressed understanding, especially when the decision of the child protection agency was counter the child's wishes. Then they would be, you know, extremely explanatory and they would, they would, um, 
so providing information and giving explanations was a big, you know, this was a big deal in this, this approach. Um, but also saying, you know, I'm, this is really something that I would like you to take the lead on. So this was an important one. And it was paired with emotional, um, with emotion work, um, providing support, providing guidance, um, sharing empathy. And they also, uh, what I said, they created youth citizens. And what, what I mean by this, that um, uh, they, they in their heads, so I talked earlier about child protection workers' uh, attitudes and skills. So in their um, imagination, in their attitudes, in their views of children, they viewed, there was a clear di boundary dividing line between children who were 10 and older and younger children. And um, they, they uh, tended to view older children as much more and treat them as much more active participants than younger children. They viewed, especially teens, as powerful, as potentially defiant, um, as being able to resist interventions. So um, uh, in, their, in, in their imagination, in their consciousness, um, uh, older children were very much, um, they were very much, you know, individuals with power. Um, so, um, let's go to the next one. Um, so, I would just like to briefly summarize what I found, which is that half of the study participants used, almost half of them, used several approaches to creating opportunities for children to participate. And I think that these, these participatory practices that I just told you about, they very much overlap with anti-oppressive social work practice and with the tools that social workers, from what I know, are, you know, trained with, such as engagement practices. Um, uh, practice is to build trust to create rapport with your uh, with your um, with your clients or service users um, but um, uh, what is also noteworthy is that they, their ways of doing participation did not reach the upper lung rungs of participation on this ladder that I showed you earlier now uh, where do you so if you think of the ladder of youth participation and you look at the top uh, it was not youth initiated typically it was not youth initiated and directed it was most adult initiated shared decisions with youth and also informed uh, uh, you know information providing information this is what that mostly looked like so now you know when I think about what is it that still needs to be done it, there's a lot that still needs to be done but I was just thinking generally how do we get to the point where children share decisions with adults so how do we reach the top top level um, of the ladder and in terms of uh, street level bureaucrat practices. Um, I was thinking, you know, of myself, um, I'm just starting to um, teach online next week. I've never taught online. How do you get people like me to totally rethink their, their teaching practices? Um, uh, um, you know, I'm a street level bureaucrat. How do you get people like me to do that? How did I do that? <laughs> so how do we get street level bureaucrats who do not use participatory practices to use them? And how do we get street level bureaucrats who do participation at the lower rungs to reach the higher rungs of the ladder to, to you know to go up there so, uh, to how do we allow children so if you wanted to, to turn this around and phrase it in a child-centric way how do we allow how do we create the conditions and opportunities um, through street level bureaucracy through organizations with the help of organizational structures to um, and and rules um, uh, to um, to encourage um, youth initiated, child initiated um, decision making. Now, uh, my thinking, because I'm also, you know, I also wear the hat of a researcher, not only of a street level bureaucrat, my thinking is that, you know, we'll need to come up, develop with, and there are already several tools and models out there, but uh, we'll need to, uh, I think further work needs to be done on, um, uh, on evidence-based um, uh, practices. So one could, could one, if one were to be child-centric all the way, Okay, one uh, could um, conduct new participatory research with children and young people um, and look at existing research uh, and create an evidence a base uh, or a base of ideas create and then based on this evidence create interventions you know what is it that has worked that we can actually um, and then evaluate these interventions um, and implement them and disseminate them um, and um, 
also create easily accessible opportunities for adaptations like workshops, toolkits, how to books. So I was just thinking of myself, what is it, how is it that my, you know, my whole practice is now changing because of the coronavirus and I, me having to teach online. How is it that I did that within a very short period of time now? Um, so uh, you'll need to reward further in innovation in that field, is my thinking. And also, I think there's already very creative stuff out there from interdisciplinary knowledge based on interdisciplinary knowledge that we could tap into. So I was just thinking of two areas, two domains. Um, uh, one is business management. Um, uh, uh, there is one uh, article that I, I found in the Harvard Business Review by Gary Hamel from 2006, which talks about multipliers of human creativity. And so first it's like, what are these multipliers? You have a chunky problem, like, you know, you're really trying to up the ante on children's participation in child protection and other areas. You, uh, you, um, you get go at this problem with fresh principles, with unorthodox thinking, and you also use wisdom from the fringe, from the edges. Okay? Um, and then I was also thinking of another field that I was trained in, uh, you know, when I was a little younger than I am now, which was international development. Um, and uh, international development in the 80s, uh, Robert Chambers from the University of Sussex developed a tool that's called participatory rural appraisal, which then morphed into participatory learning and action, PLA. Uh, and this is a tool that um, invites, that involves a community of people to to, um, uh, to develop uh, initiatives and programs to improve the community. Uh, so this is also centered around a certain problem that the community wants to deal with. So, um, uh, but the, you know, there are many other um, uh, approaches out there that could be really useful for uh, moving the needle forward. Okay, I hope that I, this has been some food for thought um, for you. Um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I would like to, these are my acknowledgements. Um, very grateful for all these individuals and um, uh, the funding I received for this study. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kati. Um, that was very, very interesting. And I guess I have to hurry to use that voucher and buy your book and actually read it to get all the details. Um, thank you. Yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> um, Right, I'm sure there are many questions from the audience, but I suggest that we um, only take uh, questions for clarification at this stage and then um, direct questions uh, to you and everyone else after we've had our panel introductions. Um, I don't know if anyone would like to ask a question, just to remind the audience that you can use the chat function in Zoom and send us uh, questions and I will take them from here then. But there's nothing right now, so I think we move ahead. We have a fantastic panel today. I'm really happy to have you all here. Um, let me first introduce uh, Caroline and Matilda to you. Um, they are um, the pros or expert by experience at the Change Factory, which uh, for those of you that are not familiar with it, is a fantastic organization gathering knowledge and experiences from young people in welfare systems. And they work with professionals and politicians to improve the welfare system in Norway. Welcome. Um, I would also like to welcome uh, on behalf of all of us, Marta Slara Engedal from uh, UNICEF Norway. She's a legal advisor and child's rights specialist there. Welcome, Marta. Um, next, we have Katre Luhama, a legal scholar and expert in children's rights at the University of Tartu in Estonia. Katre was actually here in Bergen with us until very recently, so we miss her greatly. But she remains with us as a member of the child rights unit at Law Transform and a collaborator at the center. And last but not least, of course, we have Marit Chivines, Professor of Political Science here at the University of Bergen and Head of the uh, Center for Research and Discretion and Paternalism. Marit has many years of experience um, studying child protection and child protection systems in an international comparative context. So welcome everybody and um, let's get started with Caroline and Matilde who can provide probably the most important perspective here today, um, that of children and young people. So over to you. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Matilda and I am a pro in the Change Factory. And um, yeah, what's your name? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my name is uh, Caroline and I'm a pro in the Change Factory. And uh, yeah. Yeah, so our job uh, or the Change Factory has spoken to 1,700 kids in child welfare systems in Norway. Uh, and our job as pros is to lift that knowledge. Uh, to Norway and to other like uh, someone I need. Uh, yeah. 
like this, yeah. So that's like, we don't talk from our story, our own story, even though we have experience, we talk from all those kids that have given important answers to the change factory. Um, so we're gonna talk about participation. And in Norway, uh, participation is in our CPS law, but not enough and not deep enough for, um, to like understand how is actually supposed to be done. Um, and when we ask kids, there are two levels of participation, uh, like individual levels, like with me and my life, and then systemic. But we'll start with individual. And the chief I asked kids, what does participation mean? Uh, they first of all said that we need to call it something else because uh, participation is like, um, it's kind of like something a kid has to do, but there's no like, you don't do it together, which is what kids want to. So they uh, want it to be called like cooperation or something like that. Uh, but we'll just call it participation today because it's a little bit easier to remember. <laughs> yeah, uh, so to allow for kids to do participation, they have to get information about their life and about the welfare system and what happens with what they say and so they can like express their view freely. Uh, and to do that they have to be spoken alone and be spoken to first and yeah, know what happens to what they say. And they also have to be asked uh, who feels safe to talk to and where it feels safe to talk and express their view. Yeah, so those are two of the points, uh, information and expressing your view freely. Uh, and then the third thing that kids say uh, is being a part of decision making which is like, we just have to, like, kids don't ask, like, we have to decide everything, but they have to be, they have to have a say in the decision-making part of um, the child welfare system. And then the third thing, no, the fourth thing <laughs> is uh, protecting what kids say uh, to the CPS, like, the adults there have to, um, have to protect our privacy or what we tell them, because, uh, if not, kids can't really speak freely. It's like a big part of that. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and in the Child Right Convention, these four things that kids have pointed on is also uh, rights that kids have. And we noticed that um, a couple of, no, a time ago, that uh, the answers from kids and the Child Right Convention they are almost the same. They're actually very, very alike in very many points. So uh, we know that those four things that kids have said are important are also in the child convention. Yeah. And uh, those four things uh, or the rights are right to information as I talked about earlier and right to protection of their privacy. Uh, and right to express their view freely and also the last is right to decisions to their best and to do the last one there you have to include all those three i said mm. um and participation is not no participation is a process like you can't just it's not a single one-time thing it has to be from start to end and these four things have to um, happen again and again, not only in the decision-making part and not only in the start or in the end, but all the way through, if um, it's going to be great for kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, uh, yeah, and this has to happen because if you want to give uh, helpful help and uh, safe help, you have to have their kids view and they have to have spoken freely because it's not, if not, uh, it's a lot of, if not. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that's like in the decision-making part, the kid's view um, needs to be like a fundamental thing in that decision, because uh, if not, there could be, you could be giving help that isn't actually useful for kids. Um, so then you don't really know if you're helping kids or not. And that's 
necessary. Uh, and then systemic participation um, is kind of the same thing, but just that there you have to hear groups of kids and use those answers to decide on a system level. So like the different systems for children and the ministry and the parliament, they have to listen to uh, groups of kids when they decide stuff for kids in a country. Um, and that always you know, also says, wait, what? <laughs> um, that also is in the Child Right Convention that also in groups, kids have to be heard. And it's uh, most of the same things because the consequences are still there if uh, kids are not heard. Uh, but it might be even more important as it's about bigger things often and uh, it'll be like, it'll affect more kids. So every law, every guideline, every routine has to listen to kids before they decide what it's gonna be. Yeah. I mean, we could say more, <laughs> but uh, it's an introduction. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Caroline and Matilda. This is um, this is great and makes my uh, move to the next panelist very easy because Marta is up next. Then she can say something about the UNICEF perspective, and you've mentioned the Child Rights Convention. So, um, Marta. Yes, you. thank you. So, thank you to you, Janne, but also to Catherine, Caroline, and Matilda. I mean. Uh, I will repeat a lot of the things you've already said because Karen and Matilda, as you said, you, you, you've talked about uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child and you, yeah, you have so many great points, <laughs> but I will repeat the great points. Uh, so I'm going to say something, try to be brief, on the legal status of the right of the children to be heard and its relation to children's participation. Um, but I will also say something about the implementation of this right in Norway. Um, so children's right to being heard is one of the four core principles in the Convention of the Rights of the Child and I will refer to it as the CRC. Uh, the other core, uh, three core principles are the right to non-discrimination, the right to life and development and the primary consideration of the child's best interests. Now all these four core principles are found in each it, its uh, own individual article, but they also establish rules for interpretation and implementation of the other rights. Um, for example, uh, in the assessment of the best interest of the child, the child's own view uh, should also always be central. So according to Article 12, where we find uh, the right of the child to be heard, uh, state parties to the convention, which is, just a side note, every state in the world except the United States, uh, every state party shall ensure children who is capable of forming their own views, the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting them, and the views of the child is to be given due weight in accordance with the age and maturity of the child. So the wording shall assure leaves no leeway of uh, discretion when it comes to the exercising of this right. So it cannot be ter interpreted away. Uh, and this has also been stressed by the Committee of the Rights of the Child. And it really highlights the special status of this right. So uh, Article 12 ensures the right to, of the child to being heard, not only individuals, but also as a group, as Carolina and Matilda mentioned. Uh, and it's essential in the recognition of children as independent subjects of rights. Uh, at the same time, it does, not, it does not give them full autonomy as adults. And that's also uh, something Caroline and Matilda pointed to. So it could be explained as a right to co-determination uh, or, uh, or, and not self-determination. Uh, in legal terms, the right to be heard is not simply a right of children to speak their mind and express their views, but it places strong obligations on the state to create child-friendly arrangements for how this uh, is supposed to happen. Uh, and Catherine talked about that. Uh, but the, the state uh, is obligated to facilitate uh, that the child receive support and encouragement to present their own view, but also receive relevant information and child-friendly information, uh, and they're also uh, entitled to feedback on how their views has been understood and interpreted and emphasis, as also Caroline and Matilda mentioned. 
Mm. It should also be stated or noted that uh, children's right to be heard is not placed a duty on the child to express its own view, but a right or it implies a right to participate in all matters affecting that child. So other rights in the CRC also applying a right to participation is the right to information, the right to freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of association. So although a right to participation is actually not stated directly in the CRC, uh, several of the rights um, expressed there uh, kind of gives um, uh, yeah, gives us a <laughs> gives us a right to say that children have right to participation, um, and participation uh, is I would say at the core of the implementation of the right of children to be heard because the right of a child to be heard is not just a momentary uh, one-time act; uh, it's supposed to be an ongoing process, uh, which is also stated by the Committee of the Right of the Child. So uh, the state cannot just uh, listen or uh, yeah, listen to the uh, views of the child one time and then kind of say that they've done their job. Uh, it's a continuous process. Uh, and the Committee of the Rights of the Child uh, states that real participation should be understood as an intense exchange between children and adults in the development of policies, programs and measures in all relevant contexts to children's lives. So based on this, in my view, uh, the right of the child is vital to the full implementation of CRC as a whole, because it requires the states to include children in the actual implementation. Um, so in sum, uh, implementation of the right uh, of child to be heard is not a matter of children exercising a privilege, as it is sometimes portrayed, but a matter of children exercising their right. So in the Norwegian context, I will try to be brief. Um, the Committee of the Rights of the Child has stated that uh, in the legal sphere, Norway has sort of done its job. It's uh, well implemented in legal context, but in the actual implementation uh, in practice, we still have a way to go. Uh, for example, uh, some groups of children are listed as very vulnerable uh, in the context of uh, using or um, yeah, taking use of their right to being heard uh, and the committee uh, recommends that Norway is actually strengthening their efforts to, to ensure that every child uh, is able to exercise the right to uh, being heard. Uh, and as Matilda and uh, Carolina said, uh, there are many children in Norway not feeling that. Um, also, I'm just going to mention one Supreme Court from 2019, which is uh, while well, questioning if we're <laughs> moving in the right direction or not. Uh, so the Supreme Court actually interpreted uh, away the right uh, of a child to being heard in an individual case because they uh, argued that it was to the uh, this child's best interest not being heard in his case. Uh, and of course that's an individual case and I don't know all the details but uh, the way I understand it, it's uh, well, you can question if it's in, in accordance with uh, the Convention of the Rights of the Child and the very clear uh, recommendations made by the Committee of the Rights of the Child. Uh, yeah, I'm going to end there, uh, but I will just say that <laughs> it's obvious that Norwegian legislation in large uh, is in compliance with the wording of Article 12, but there are barriers, real barriers, to the actual implementation. Uh, and some, uh, an important barrier, I think, uh, that's my personal view, it's uh, adults' uh, attitudes towards children and, uh, and their exercising of their right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matte. Um, very interesting. And uh, it will be interesting to hear now from Katra, who can say something about a different country, um, Estonia, because we know that Norway always does really well in, in terms of the legal protections of children and the difference between uh, law and practice um, is, is to be discussed, of course. But let's hear from Katra about uh, Estonia. Yes. Uh, can you hear me first? Uh, thank you, everyone. I think that in a way our discussion will be a very round one, including all these different perspectives, because I want to talk about professionals and how easy or difficult 
it is for the professionals to adopt these new understandings and, and actually incorporate and implement child rights. And um, um, here in Tartu, we are trying to um, conceptualize, we understand the child's participation um, as part of child's agency or child's empowerment that uh, uh, how to um, improve or support children in their lived experiences and, and how would they come out of these difficult legal proceedings, for example, removal proceedings, uh, empowered and, and feeling that they had some kind of say. And um, as a background context, then in uh, 2014, Estonia aimed to uh, fully incorporate and implement CRC, including Article 12 and the child's right to be heard into its national legislation. And in uh, 2017 and 18, we conducted a survey among child protection workers in order to uh, see whether this, uh, this uh, uh, reform actually had uh, taken effect, whether this had actually influenced the way that uh, child protection workers think. And uh, within the IDEA project, then we uh, surveyed 96 uh, child protection workers in Estonia, including they were able to give us open-ended answers to questions. And we wanted to understand how they understood child rights, but also whether they were able to implement these rights in their daily practices. And uh, 96 uh, child protection workers replied to us, and they said that, of course, after the reform, they full and well understood all the child rights and understood how important these rights were. At the same time, they evaluated the child's right to participate in legal proceedings as the least important from the rights that they were given. So you see there is this kind of uh, friction already. Uh, we understand that your rights to children are important, but we don't think that uh, your right to participate is actually so important. And uh, at the same time, they say that they are very capable of, of uh, including children in their legal proceedings, uh, hearing the child, and that they uh, fully thought they mastered the art of hearing the child and, and including the child. But when, of course, uh, we looked at how they described their practices beyond this kind of perceived uh, knowledge and perceived practice, then um, we saw that they said that they did not include children in the proceedings quite often in order to protect them. And they saw their need to protect the child uh, as more important than the need to inform the child or the need to include the child in the proceedings. And this, of course, resulted then that in the fact that they uh, not always met the child, uh, especially when the child was small um, and uh, like in, in uh, Katrin's uh, study, they drew the age limit around 10, um, uh, sometimes even higher to 12. And uh, they also, when specifically asked whether they were able to uh, meet and hear uh, children from migrant background and, and from um, uh, children who have some kind of special needs, then they admitted that, that this was their deficiency, they were not able to do that and they did not do that. Um, when um, we asked uh, what did they mean uh, when they talk about um, uh, child's participation, then their focus was on receiving information and gathering information rather than including informing the child, uh, um, giving the child information about the proceedings in general, as well as the uh, decision that was later made. So, um, and it was not even clear for them who was the one responsible giving the information to the child. As uh, child protection workers thought that the lawyers and the judge should do that, uh, and the lawyers thought that, well, the child protection workers should do that. And so, um, um, they also pointed out that, that it was very difficult to hear these uh, children in these legal proceedings where um, some problems with their families were discussed because children were too loyal to parents and too attached to parents. Thus, they were not uh, fully reliable uh, sources of information as well as uh, it was difficult to uh, include them in the proceedings. So to conclude, um, even though 
you might mean well when reforming the legal system and, and, and trying to introduce these kind of new concepts and, and operationalization uh, to national legislation, then it is still a very conservative process that professionals work in. And, and even though they use this new language that they have learned through their trainings, uh, actually it is very difficult for the uh, practitioners to uh, reconceptualize and restart uh, the ways uh, that they think about child participation and then actually start moving towards uh, what, what the CRC requires and, and, and giving the child a voice, including the child in the proceedings and, and uh, giving full information to the child uh, and also respecting the uh, child's evolving capacities and, and their uh, personal and individual needs. So thank you. Thank you, Katra. Finally then, Marit, as someone who has a lot of experience with comparing child protection systems internationally, um, maybe you can say something about what we know about the status quo sort of international about uh, children's participation in these proceedings. Thank you, thank you, uh, Yanni, and um, thank you, everyone. It's been kind of really interesting to hear the various presentations, and I can see that they kind of try to tie together the, the various dots. Um, so, so how are we in a way? So, because I think that uh, um, we are talking about children's rights, uh, and I think that just picking up from what uh, Katra said and the paradox between. Uh, professionals are saying that, yeah, we are really, really good uh, taking care of children's rights and we are absolutely involved in them and we are kind of letting them participate. And when you then go into detail and see are they actually doing it, or if you speak with children themselves, they will say, uh-uh, no, we do not feel that we are involved, we do not feel that we are participating properly. Uh, and I think that that one of the challenges um, and, and what this um, is about is was, uh, what, what Marte said. Uh, and I think, I'm kind of, of course, putting a little bit of words in your mouth now, uh, Marte, but it said it's about attitudes. And I think that that's a really, really important part of um, how we view children. Because if we don't view children as moral individuals, uh, if we don't view them as kind of equal as the rest of us adults, then we are kind of, um, we are not kind of approaching them in the right manner. So that means that we will already be paternalistic. We will already know that we know better than them and that we also know more than them. And of course, in one way, we have the training. So it's even worse when you are a psychologist or a legal scholar and you know a little bit about children, because then you definitely have also the kind of the skills to say that I know your best and your best and your best. So I think that that is one of the difficult tasks for us uh, is to, to kind of to make these changes, which is necessary to do in the culture, because this is about how we regard children, how we view them. And that's about a child perspective, which is about equality and that children are on equal footing as the rest. Of the individual. So, and that I think is very interesting what, what uh, Kati and her book is now pointing out because just kind of giving them kind of the citizenship approach and kind of saying that yes, they are individuals in our society. Uh, that, uh, that's a kind of a very fascinating and important uh, approach. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, and yes, Yanni, I know that you asked, so I will come to it. <laughs> I saw that you're kind of getting word now. <laughs> but um, um, so, how are we uh, in terms of uh, children's participation if we compare us with other countries? And we are actually quite good. So, we are kind of, we are in Norway, we are kind of, we have been thinking about children's rights for quite some time. Uh, and we are in some way what we would call child-centric in our society in a way. Uh, and we also, as, as has been said now, we have incorporated the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child fully into national legislation. So we kind of, all the formal frames are in a way in place. 
but it's kind of the interpretation and, and kind of how we apply it to the implementation in practice, which is one of the major challenges. Um, if we should, so, so I would say the answer to your question, Jenny, is that I think that we are doing fairly good in Norway and that there are many, many countries in which uh, children's participation is kind of more tokenism and more kind of uh, not uh, uh, being according to the, to the convention. At the same time, we do know that England, for example, and actually also the American system in which they have advocacy or in which they have lawyers representing children. Uh, and based on research, that's one of the kind of the best ways to, to kind of to, to get at least children heard uh, in legal processes. I do not think that they, children themselves will say that they feel that they have been kind of fully involved, but, but at least that is if you evaluate various kind of participatory processes, that would be kind of one way. But still, uh, I would say that, that we, we, are not, we are not the worst. And one of the reasons also why we are doing kind of not too bad is actually uh, for people like uh, uh, Caroline and Matilda and, and the expert by experience, that they have been putting this on the agenda. They have been repeatedly on all levels in our uh, system, to politicians, to municipalities, and to, to county boards and to the courts and so on and so forth. Um, so um, what I wanted to, to take the next step then is um, possibly kind of to, or maybe I should give the ball back to you, um, Jenny, and then, uh, and then you can kind of take the conversation on. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank Excellent. You. Uh, thank you, Marit. So thank you all so much for your contributions. This was very interesting to hear your different uh, angles and perspectives. And um, before we open up for questions from the audience, uh, here's the reminder, if you have a question, please just type it into the chat window and then I can and take it. Um, I have a question that uh, sort of relates a bit to what Marte also said. And this was sort of when you refer to the Supreme Court case where it was argued that it was in the child's best interest not to be heard. And, and we have this statement that we often come across in child protection um, cases where it's, it's being said that it's it, children also have a right to not participate and this is sort of an interesting one um, to explore because I can at least I can see sort of the possibility of abusing this as, a, as an argument for not talking to children and involving children in the process um, uh, and, and therefore I wanted to know um, what you think, what our panelists think about this and maybe um, Kati we can start with you because you did your research on this and I wonder whether you came across that situation of, of you know, children having a right to, to stay out of the process if they so choose and then of course after that I would like to hear from maybe Caroline and Matilde to hear their view on, on what they think this, this means, yeah. Yes, I think this is a good question. Um, it relates to uh, one of my chapters, which is about triggers of non-participation. Um, and um, that's when workers said that they, um, that they, for instance, they fear to re-traumatize children uh, when they have been exposed to abuse, um, when they uh, have them or encourage them to participate. On the other hand, um, there are also I, there are also Norwegian. I just went through the book again. Uh, you know, I skimmed the book again uh, before I came on, and there uh, I remember Norwegian workers who said that um, they um, you know they give children, they ask children. Um, whether they would like to participate in a cert certain situation or not. So th that is a choice that they are giving. Um, so, uh, you know, you can make this part of the process. Okay, that's my response. Thank you, Kati. Um, uh, Caroline Matilde, would you like to comment from your perspective on this? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, but the for a sec. Uh, yeah, uh, when kids don't want to participate, although adults need to think of it as uh, it being not safe enough for them to participate. And uh, yeah, kids uh, use that right to not participate, to protect themselves when it's not safe enough to express their uh, view or uh, to say what they actually feel. Um, it's like a protection. Um, and if we want kids uh, to tell about difficult things or important things, 
adults have to take the responsibility and make it safe. And um, uh, and before an adult says that kids don't want to participate, um, they have to do everything they can to make it safe um, first and fulfill uh, the children's basic rights like information and um, protection of their privacy and uh, what's the last one? I don't remember. Um, yeah, and then it has to be safe enough and then if it child doesn't want to, but they have to say it themselves that they don't want to um, because the consequences of it can be pretty serious because the decision uh, could be wrong, the decision could be uh, not useful and it could be scary and that works dangerous for children. Um, and also uh, they cannot say that the decision is the child's best as children's no, the Child Right Convention clearly states that you cannot make a decision to a child's best without the child's view expressed freely. Thank you. I think this is a really useful um, reminder that uh, what you mentioned, it's, it's that sometimes we stop too early maybe. We haven't created the safe space for, for children and young people to really speak their mind and we think it's that's why they don't want to participate, but we need to sort of dig deeper. So I think this is very, um, very a great contribution from, from you here that goes beyond what the law maybe says, you know, that um, we should not give up too soon. Um, just one question maybe to follow up on this. What would your recommendation be when it concerns very young children? I mean, you mentioned that we should have the group of children representing um, children's views in these processes, but with very, very young children, maybe it's not possible to ask them directly. And do you have any recommendations what decision makers could do here? Um, like with how young kids you can talk to? Yeah, or what, what would be, I mean, who would you trust to represent a child that cannot speak for herself or himself, maybe? Like who is the best proxy for that situation? Um, you have to try your best to let that child speak for itself because there is no one else who could possibly know. Um, yeah. Um, yeah and, uh, the adults have to like make their children's view important and tell them that you have to express yourself. I want to know what you mean about this and like make it like an important thing so the child can think, oh my expression and my uh, yeah. view is important so I can say it and also ask the child which person is safe to talk to. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe uh, following from this, Martin, maybe you want to chip in here and sort of suggest what from UNICEF's perspective, what, what would you say how we would um, ideally, um, from a procedural perspective, maybe ensure that we have the child's perspective or view, uh, if, if we can get a view of, from the child, but how would we make mm -hmm. sure that we incorporate the child's right to participate uh, without necessarily speaking uh, herself, mm. say like, very young kids or children mm. in a situation where they're unable to do so, what would you say? Mm. So, I mean, of course, it will be individual uh, if it's individual cases, but uh, the Committee of the Rights of the Child very clearly states that children are able to express their views from a very early age, uh, not necessarily by full sentences in the way an adult would do, but from a very early age. And of course, uh, Article 12 also says that uh, it should be given due weight according to age and maturity. So, I mean, there's always um, room to kind of weight how much weight you should give uh, to the children's views. Um, but I mean, uh, I think what Caroline and Matilde said in creating sort of safe, safe spaces for children to give their views, and that would, of course, have to be adjusted to age and maturity. Uh, yeah. Um, but also, as you pointed to, uh, maybe we stop too early uh, and it's very, uh, res probably <laughs> very resource uh, demanding, but also as uh, the committee states that uh, when it comes to these four core principles, resources is not a question. Uh, so it shouldn't be a, yeah, a matter of uh, resources or question of resources when actually implementing uh, those 
four core uh, rights. Thank you. Um, I actually just got a question from uh, Kati who would like to know um, from Caroline and Matilde and to, ex to explain a bit more um, about why you prefer the term collaboration to participation. Um, uh, it's because um, participation uh, or like in Norwegian it makes uh, kind of more sense because the words are a little bit different there. Uh, but participation, uh, or the word for it in Norwegian, is like a thing that a kid is taken into like the process to do and not like something that me and the adult does together. And it's not like, it doesn't say that it has to last like um, the whole process. It's just like, it sounds like a one-time thing and it sounds like something we're not doing together, um, which kids have said that that's the most important thing that to help me you have to like do it with me and find good solutions together with me so that's why thank you um okay um another question that has come up is um with regard to a narrow versus a broad understanding of participation under article um, 12. so um, on a narrow understanding we can see participation as being primarily about teasing out a child's view and opinion um, versus on a broader understanding it, it's more what marit um, mentioned before a fundamental basis for child equality perspective in which children are regarded as equal moral individuals and it's more about our conception of children in general so in terms of decision making the question is if the narrow understanding is even legitimate or if we should go beyond just hearing a child getting the view and then we're done with it and um, i don't know if anyone would like to answer this uh, question in the I know. Yeah. I mean, I can uh, give my view on it, or Unicef's view. It would definitely be taking the broader approach, as Marit said and you said. Uh, and I try to sort of say in my presentation that uh, uh, it's the right to being heard is clearly not uh, a right just securing that one time. Uh, children uh, provides its uh, perspective and then the, the process moves on. Uh, the child is entitled to being a part of that whole process according to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And, um, and I think uh, you find no legal kind of arguments to, uh, or uh, good enough arguments to interpret it in a very narrow way. Marit, did you also want to comment? Yeah, because you know it is kind of popping up questions. So, uh, so I uh, just wanted to chime in to what uh, to not uh, say. But I think that the, the, the description that uh, to given from um, from Carlina and Matilda, and also what we hear here from from uh, from Carty's, uh, approach to it, is absolutely that you need, you must have a broader perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you you can't talk about participation or collaboration or or, or samarbeid, as we would say in Norwegian. It's just kind of, yeah, well, how could you do that? Because I think there was one quote from a report that you made. Um, it was um, a child, uh, uh, a young person interviewed saying, well, as a five-year-old, I know a lot about myself. And you need to know as a decision maker about this to make a good decision. And I think that it's just kind of, yes, of course, a five-year-old know a lot about him or herself. Uh, so I think just kind of having that as a core and then you have to, of course, take every specific situation and every specific family and child uh, to kind of to meet their needs and their interests. So, yeah. So, thank you. Mm. Thank you. Um, next, we have a question for Kati. Um, did the US and Norwegian child protection workers connect the need to protect the child with their empowerment? How would they balance the need to empower the child and the need to protect the child? Yes, they did. Yes, Carter, they did so uh, very much, especially for older children, um, those who talk about encouraging participation. And um, the way they connected it was, um, for instance, when they said that uh, when uh, you um, 
create an intervention like a removal um, and um, uh, the child is not on board with it. You have not, you know, consulted the child. You have not received fees feedback. You have not. There has not been participation. Then you risk the. Um, you risk actually um, endangering this child, putting the child at risk because the child may run um, if you are putting the child in a placement that the child didn't want. So you you could make things worse by uh, through non-participation and participation now at, in terms of collaboration. And you know that's exactly what you don't want to do. So um, they they provided many examples of of especially of teens when they uh, did that. Um, in terms, but they were, it also differed by the process, the stage in a case. So, um, and that was the case for both workers, for both, for workers in both countries. Um, when workers talked about the front end of a case, about investigations, um, then um, the focus was very much on, um, on um, investigation of risk assessment, um, uh, you know, that often then trumped, um, I hate to use that word anymore, but uh, it often won out over, um, over uh, empowerment. Uh, but with older children, you could see that there was a, that they, that they clearly made a connection. I hope this answers your question. Thank you, Patty. Um, we have another question from the audience, um, which is very interesting. How far can the positive obligations of the right to participation be extended to practically empower children and create the best conditions for them to exercise it. And as an example here is um, mentioned, um, can it be used to partly justify providing psychological support when needed, proper support for vulnerable children such, such as the disabled and immigrants? Um, would anyone on the panel like to answer this? Katra, yes. Um, I skipped this part in my in my short talk, so, so perhaps uh, I would uh, uh, include here uh, her name, uh, Laura Lundi, and she in 2007 uh, tried to conceptualize or, or show what different elements the meaningful participation of the child should entail. And she talks about the space, the demand that the child has to have a free uh, opportunity to express their view. And then uh, she talks about the voice. And this is, I think, uh, closely connected to this question that uh, a child, when necessary, has to be assisted in, in giving the voice to the child. And this assistance could be uh, in very different forms and for different uh, needs, you, you have to assist the child in different ways. So uh, in some cases, it is enough when you provide uh, adequate uh, linguistic support or translation so that the child actually understands and the child actually can talk. But in some other cases, it might need something else. Uh, for example, um, very safe space or, or this kind of uh, support animals even or what, what, whatever the child might need. And then, of course, the audience that the authorities must listen, actually listen to the child's voice, not just record it somewhere, but, but uh, try to understand the specific child's voice and then the influence, short term, long term influence. And then the wheel would start turning again you, you, because the child grows. And of course, the decisions that, that the child's, uh, child is included um, then, then might also change. Um, then, then you have to consider these elements again and, and, and this is this kind of ongoing process where all these four elements are very relevant and, and specifically this kind of giving the child a voice, every child a voice. Um, there are uh, possibilities and there are uh, uh, means through which you can give the child a voice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got another question here, and that uh, relates to uh, Kati again. You, <laughs> it's uh, concerning citizenship, and the question is, what your thoughts are on what particip participation involves from the other side of children's citizenship? And the idea here is, sort of thinking about responsibilities and accountability, the demands that it could entail formally or informally for children. So. It means that if we're asking and allowing children to participate, are we also maybe to some degree making them responsible or accountable for their actions and decisions and how we should deal with that? Is that maybe placing like a burden on, on children? Um, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, my thoughts are that, um, you know, this could lead you down to a rabbit hole because um, then this sort of leads to the, or it sounds very similar to me to, 
um, it's sort of it could be an excuse like um, the you know like saying oh children are you know young children are too vulnerable to participate or children in, gen in general are too vulnerable to participate so I think you would have to be very careful um, about um, you know um, how to how you think about this even um, how you think about responsibilities um, I, I'd really I'd have to think about that some more how to answer that intelligently <laughs> <laughs> thank you um, but yeah my, my initial reaction would also be to say that it, it sounds like something that could be used as an excuse so more in line with what Caroline and Matilde said that it's more about how we do it how we create a safe space and how we communicate um, the decision and so on to, to maybe reduce that risk of, of coming across as holding children responsible if then things maybe don't go so well or something um, yes, and our, we also should, you know, in, in the back of our minds, we should also have the yardstick that um, uh, David Archer and Marit talked about. What are our expectations for children? You know, that would not be our expectations for adults. Are we putting, you know, expectations on children that we wouldn't put on adults? So, um, you know, I think that's another yardstick that you have to keep in mind. You know, what is it that we're doing comparatively? Um, so I think that's something to think about. Yes, thank you. Um, another question. Oh, they're popping in here today. Um, so I think it's a general question for everyone on the panel. Um, what do you think about ensuring and understanding participation in high risk or emergency situations where, for example, information and time are often downplayed against the need for protection? And there's also a comparative question. If we see similar patterns for participation in uh, between different uh, child welfare systems orientation. So I guess one that, that one is for Kati and Marit maybe to answer. But the first one I think is very interesting. Does, does anyone want to chip in here? Yeah, so so uh, would you just repeat the question? I mean, so, yeah. sorry. So the, be, sure. Uh, so yeah. the question is um, the, the challenge, I guess, of um, a balancing information and time taken to to participate to to create the safe space that we have heard so much about um in situations where there's a need a very sort of urgent need for protection so an emergency situation high risk so how would we kind of balance that and, and reconcile those two yeah i think that's could i start on that one yeah i think that because i think that's that, that's a difficult one in a way uh, and, and i think it's also very very relevant because that's that's the situation uh, sometimes it is just a high risk situation and depending also on the age of, of the child of course uh, what i did see in in the same report that i made a reference to later on which is uh, uh, early on i mean um which is rat and sicker uh, yeah. So it's kind of, uh, it's, um, I, well, I don't have a good translation for it, but it's kind of uh, following, following the law, but also uh, being safe. Um, and, and what you pointed out is that, that the child would, even though there, it is a difficult and a riskful situation, the child would kind of know themselves. If they didn't have to happen at the exact minute that the child protection services or the adults discovered that something bad was going on or something riskful was going on. So it was kind of that also then needed to, to cooperate mm -hmm. uh, and, and to kind of to make sure that you took it in the steps um, that the child would, uh, would prefer. But of course, that is a dilemma. Uh, and I think that that is just kind of not necessarily uh, an easy one to handle because if it is high risk, then you would, um, yeah. So I don't know if you would kind of chime in on that one or if that's... Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's kind of difficult, but you just have to uh, listen to the children and like ask them if it's important to move now or if you want to wait or just like, I don't know how to explain it. Because but also in those uh, high risk situations, um, children still have a lot of knowledge about their lives mm -hmm. and important knowledge about their lives. and. Uh, maybe adults are scared um, because that something bad will happen to me today, but I know that it won't happen today. So it doesn't, it's not actually as high risk as it sounds. Uh, but you can't know that until you talk to kids. So it has to be um, a priority, even when it's like a high risk situation. Uh, also because of the consequences that kids have said that 
um, not cooperating with them, uh, even though it's high risk, uh, it can make them um, oh, hmm. um, like pull back what they said. If they if I started telling about something difficult, I could take that back. I could stop. Um, like I could just not talk anymore uh, or say that that was just a joke or something. Um, and that is pretty serious because um, kids stop actually talking to the CPS because they lose all their trust uh, when that happens and um, then you can't help kids. Hmm. Could I, I just ask, uh, so because it's also correctly understood that, but, but if the social work, worker um, kind of thinks that we have to have to do it, mm -hmm. we have to move you, or we have to take you out of the situation, then they, sh they, they can do that, but they should do it in collaboration with the child. Is that correctly understood that that would be the way you would... As kind of far as it goes, you have to um, like cooperate as much as you can. Uh, and like the worst thing you can do is just not tell the kid because uh, even though we don't agree, we still need information about it. And we still need to, or after the law, actually, we need to get information and uh, say our view on it. Um, but if it still happens, we still need to be able to do that because then there might be a little bit of trust left. Thank you. Um, yeah, it sounds to me that, um, yeah, Katia, just uh, saw you. Um, so what, from what Kati said about the, the yardstick and what Carolina Matilda just said, it sounds like actually it's not that different to how we as adults want to be treated right we want to have information we want to be involved all the time so it, it's kind of astonishing in a sense that we are not better at it because we just have to look at what we would like to to know about and how we would like to be involved and then adjust it maybe slightly but um yes um i'm, I'm very glad that we're all working on improving this maybe um Kati, you had a question uh, no i just wanted to say that what uh carolina um just uh, and um Matilda said was that that's exactly what um, that's exactly what children in Spain have said. That's what children in Estonia have said. That research in the United States have said. That research has reported on. So um, I think what we are doing here right now is already a little bit. You know, we are already um, creating. This is these are the sort of this is the inception of creating something that could lead to something else. If it were formalized in rules and procedure procedures that we could then you know uh, implement, that would be uh, wonderful. But I think this is this is exactly this really chunky problems. How do you deal with a high risk situation, which is a chunky one? You know that uh, um, um, and make participation happen. I think and and then you know, take it one step further. I think that would be wonderful if, if that could come out of the center, if that could come out of Norway. Absolutely agree. Um, does, I have no more questions from the audience at this stage. Does anyone on the panel, Marit, you wanted to say something? Yep. Thank you. Yeah, so I was just wondering if we could start a conversation um, a little bit so, because you, uh, Kati, you have kind of had this example. Okay, so yeah, we have COVID-19 and we have to go online. And, and kind of you use, you have to, so yeah. And then you teach it and suddenly kind of uh, everyone is able to do it and they're kind of actually doing it very well. Um, but that is kind of a have to situation, you must. But, but then you, you point out a lot of barriers for, for children's participation. Uh, and I was just kind of wondering, if we could have a round and discuss how can we come to that situation that we want to. Because even though we have this, we have good legislation, we have a lot of talk about it, we have good intentions. And as, as also as they pointed out by Katha and by research that we have done, yeah, kind of professionals and judges, they feel, yeah, we are absolutely taking care of children's rights. But they are not, or we are not. So, so how can we kind of um, make these changes? How can we make people want to do this? Uh, since we can't expect a kind of a COVID-19 situation on this uh, children's participation part. Um, yeah, so I wanted to open up that conversation and then we can have that. Yes, um, what I miss here in, in Estonia is, is a group like Profana. Because I think that the work that you have done uh, in Norway and in a way that you have opened up adults' eyes to the fact that, that we are not so different. 
that our needs and, and, and uh, our needs in the society are not different, that we are a similar kind of human beings. I think that, that the voice that you have uh, is, is so important and, and I think that uh, Norway is benefiting tremendously from it. And I'm working very hard to find similar kind of young adults uh, who would, who would uh, in a way, tell their story or tell their group story here in Estonia. So, so I think that, that uh, communication with children, with young adults who remember still how it was or how it is, is a key to it. Anyone else would like to comment on uh, Marit's question or comment? No, so maybe I will uh, chip in there and say my own view. I think personally that one, one thing we can all do is we can watch how we talk about children because I sometimes feel that we are so aware of, of children and children's rights in in sort of the research context, in the practice context and so on. And then you, you go on the street or you go somewhere else and suddenly it's just being, someone is being referred to as just the child or too young as something. And I, I do think that in, in terms of talking about a child as a young person and like more like a moral being, like a moral individual, as Marit called it, I think that, mm -hmm. that maybe makes a small difference in changing the attitudes. And I think they're way harder to change than laws and practice maybe, but I think it's sort of a slow process, but I think we can, we can do it in a way that we're seeing in, in other areas where we have learned that language is very, very important to, because it affects how people feel and how, how they feel included or not. So maybe that's a simple thing that everyone can do um, a bit better. Um, and Marta, you wanted to say something? Yeah, no, I just, uh, I, I very strongly agree. Uh, and I think, for example, remembering that uh, every child has a voice so it's not adults giving voice to any children but we can facilitate and we can do kind of our job uh, in creating those safe spaces um, and yeah of course uh, but I, I think i agree uh, uh, language and it's so important how we use our uh, words um, but also, yes, I agree. So uh, organizations like uh, the pros, it's really important. And also uh, when it comes to children as a group, when we saw the climate uh, uh, strikes, <laughs> uh, the demonstrations, uh, I think a lot of us adults were just kind of shocked uh, and also uh, remember that um, children can have really powerful uh, messages and, and they can be really powerful agents of change in our society. And uh, I think uh, some adults felt that it was quite uncomfortable <laughs> when children took to the street and organized so well. So I think children are, yeah, they, they are the one who kind of have to uh, go in front and, and uh, help uh, us adults change uh, the way we view children. And then we need to watch our language, of course, and uh, yeah, how we address children when we meet them. So we have about a minute left. So is anyone? Oh, yeah. Yes, there was a hand, I think. I, you're very small. OK, yes. Um, Carolina Matilde, yeah. Um, uh, kind of like uh, some others said, um, we also think that it's a lot about, or it has a lot to do with how adults view children. And when we, um, or kids have come up with uh, something that we call like, uh, yeah, a kid's view or something that how you should view kids. And um, the first thing in there is that they have a lot of knowledge about their lives, that kids have a lot of knowledge about their lives and important knowledge and that they're uh, worth as much as adults and if you like if you say that you um, look at children like this you have to uh, show it in like everything you say everything you do it has to be um, that so you can't just like oh yeah kids are as much worth as adults but you have to show it really and then that kind of means you have to part uh, let kids participate or cooperate and then they need love they need to be uh, believed in and uh, taken seriously and then you have to think that kids uh, do 
as well as they can um, always, but if something hurts inside of them, then it shows on the outside. That was a very bad translation, <laughs> but that's ish. All kids do the best they can. Uh, and also another thing we think um, is important is that in school, when uh, child protection workers go to school to become child protection workers, um, they learn to become experts on kids' life, um, which means that, or kids have said this, kids know this, is that, that when they come out of school, they like know what's best, like you said, they know what's best for that kid. And that makes it like, um, Thing, you know, it blocks um, for participation because we feel that, okay, but they already know what's best for me, so why should I even say anything? Um, so that has to be changed. Excellent. I think this is a very powerful message and last words for today's event because we're at the end of our time now also. Uh, thank you very much everyone on the panel, Caroline Mathilde, Marit, Katre, Marte, Kati, and uh, all the attendees today. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you to you, Janet. Mm -hmm.